I know you heard me on the radio Flexing She loved the sound of my voice It's the best thing They ain't dreaming of the jazz all day Pick up the phone late night with Larry K I know you heard me on the radio Flexing She loved the sound of my voice It's the best thing They ain't dreaming of the jazz all day Pick up the phone late night with Larry K Fanatic Fury. I'm your host, Larry K. Great to be with you guys for another episode of Fanatic Fury. Midweek about. New Year's is coming. Happy New Year's to everybody. Hope you all enjoyed your Christmas. And us as Dolphins fans, as I said on my last video, we have had quite a nice holiday season, both leading up to Christmas uh, with a with a needed win and following Christmas on Monday Night Football with a, a dominant win against a New Orleans Saints team that had some uh, depletion in their roster due to COVID-19, but nonetheless, they had a lot of key players still in. We did what we needed to do to win, and we were dominant on the defensive side of the ball, and we came away with a needed and vital victory, which was great. Now we have coming up the Tennessee Titans. It's the Tannehill Bowl. You know, whether you like Ryan Tannehill, whether you don't like Ryan Tannehill, the fact is, you know, he was the former maybe going to be franchise quarterback here. He was a high draft pick. He was here for several seasons. Um, and so there's going to be a lot of emotion in it, whether he tries to downplay it uh, or not. I think we're going to get uh, Tenney's best shot. I think Tennessee's a good team. They're obviously a playoff team. They're a, they were certainly a Super Bowl contender uh, before Henry went out, but Henry, rumor has it, might be back before or in time for the playoffs, which makes them, once again, I think a, an upper echelon contender in this league. So this is going to be a hell of a barometer for the Miami Dolphins to see, you know, look, this is playoff football at this point. This is a playoff team. This is very, very, this is going to be January. So I was going to say late December, but no, this is going to be January. This is a playoff team uh, in January. You want to be a playoff team. You want to be a contender. You want to take the next step. We're going to have to come away with a victory from a team that has had its ups and downs lately in Tennessee and who's missing, you know, the key component of their offense, which really their offense runs through Henry. Um, they still have a good defense. They still have weapons on the outside for Tannehill. But, you know, this is a game where if our defense is as dominant as we say it is, then we are going to want to come away with a victory here uh, and then have a showdown with our AFC East foe, the New England Patriots, at home to end the season. And this is where careers are made. This is where legacies start. Uh, and this is this is or this is where floundering can happen. So let's see how this regime, and when I talk about regime, what do I say? You guys all know, GM, coach, quarterback. Let's see how they do in this game. But today I have something a little more interesting. I just wanted to, you know, I was kind of sitting around after I did my post-game video the other day. Uh, you know, sometimes I do those little cell phone videos. It's just easier than setting up shop. Um, but after I did that video, I had some thoughts, and I, I was just thinking in general about the state of the team as, you know, no matter what happens the last couple games here, I was thinking about the state of the team, where we are, and where we should be going. And I, I came up with three takes. Now, these aren't, I'm not, you guys know, I evolve as information comes in. I'm open to conversation with you guys. And by the way, please hit the like button. Please smash that subscribe button. We've been going up in subscribers. We need to continue that momentum. We got to get up higher and higher. So if you're listening for the first time or you've checked around but you haven't subscribed yet, please smash that subscribe button. And comment below with your thoughts. I mean, as those who comment know, I regularly engage with you guys. I welcome opinions. I welcome conversation. It's a it's an integral part of what this show is about. So anyway, I have these thoughts, but but in the spirit of conversation, why not? These aren't hard and fast, I'm not married to these takes, but I do kind of think there's validity to these takes. And there are three of them. And these are three, and as we're going to do today, the three three controversial takes on the Miami Dolphins. And these are things that not everybody's really talking about. Some people are, uh, but very few are. And it kind of goes against, I think, the, the consensus right now in the fan base. So I just wanted to kind of give you three controversial takes. Number one, George Godsey should remain the offensive coordinator going into next year. Now, I know you're looking at me like, Larry, what the hell are you talking about, man? You're a flip-flopper, bro. 
all season you're complaining about how Flores didn't bring in an alpha dog for OC, how Flores had a terrible hiring, you know, decision in bringing in two co-offensive coordinators from, you know, within the organization instead of going out and getting an innovative mind. Come on, Larry, you've been saying how much they've been struggling on offense. Why the hell would you bring back George Godsey? Well, here's here's why. I don't know if you've if you noticed, but partway through the season, about that midway mark when we started turning the corner, it was reported that, you know, we were no longer, you know, while they might maintain the titles of co-offensive coordinators, we were no longer kind of deliberating play calls. George Godsey was the play caller now. Whether the game planning and whatnot was a shared responsibility amongst co-OCs or whatever, whether it was George Godsey, there was no intermediary anymore, you know, between Godsey and Tua during play calling. It was just Godsey was going to be the play caller on game days. And he was inexperienced, we understand. And he struggled early on, we understand. But if you've been watching the games, here's two reasons really why I think we should stick with Godsey. Number one, continuity, right? You can't go into every season with a new offensive coordinator who wants to install basically a new offensive system, new terminology. And look, I admit, early on I said one of the things we had to do was get rid of the offensive coordinator and bring in an alpha dog with his own philosophy. But one of the things we've been doing under this regime, unfortunately, is every time we have momentum at the end of the season, we tear too many pieces away, we tear too much away, and we start slow the next season, which inhibits our ability to get into the playoffs the next year, which inhibits our ability to take the next step and be a playoff contender with some home field games in the playoffs, etc. So now we have momentum once again. And now you're saying, you know, to, to pull away the offense coordinator and install a whole new offense coordinator who's probably going to have new terminology, a whole new staff, et cetera, is going to once again cause us to have to go back to the zero point and build again. And it might hurt our momentum. Here's the thing. When he first, and this is why I'm not flip-flopping. Look, I still think that if you go back to last year, Flores should have hired an alpha OC. He should have hired a big dog OC with his own philosophies, with his own resume, et cetera. He should not have done the co-offensive coordinator. He should have not hired Studsville and Godsey from inside. He shouldn't have done it. If he could go back in time, I would still say he shouldn't do that. But now that he's already done it, now that it's already happened, you have a guy in Godsey who started out very inexperienced, who started out not having his own personality, who started out not having a way to work his offensive players. But now he's had a season of experience. So he's no longer this inexperienced guy. Now he's got this body of work. So I think continuity, now we're not bringing in some brand new guy anymore. He's not a he's not a, a green kid anymore. Now he's an experienced guy. And as he gets another year under his belt, he'll be even more experienced and et cetera and et cetera. He's, you got to start somewhere. And I did say, if you go all the way back to the summer, I did say that, look, I'm hesitant about the OC hire, but I got to trust Flores. And my trust in Flores evaporated early in the season, but now it's starting to come up a little bit again. Not sold again. I got to see how the season ends, and we're going to do our postseason analysis and all that. But look, maybe he wanted to grow his own OC. He believed in this guy, and he's, he's coming to fruition. So number one is continuity. But number two is this. We can complain about the limitations of the offense all we want, but the fact is the offensive line is still not a very good offensive line. We still don't have an alpha running back. And I'm going to get to this a little bit soon, but don't get mad at me. But Tua still has some limitations as a young quarterback too. Okay, And part of that's because of the offensive line. Part of that's because of who's in his receiving core. Part of that's because of the running game. But he has some limitations. Have you seen Godsey over the last few weeks, especially last week where we're going against a very stout defense, haven't you seen Godsey really be innovative in his play calling? Has he not schemed ways, all different kinds of innovative ways, to get the ball to our best players? Jalen Waddle, for instance. Did he not call a good game with Duke Johnson in the game before that, that won us that game? Does he not adjust the offensive game plans week to week to target vulnerabilities in defenses. Like one week, and I know people out here saying, oh, Devontae Parker disappeared. He disappeared. He's got to be better. Sometimes you plan an offensive game plan to attack a weakness in the defense, and the defense can try to take away one player or another. And sometimes certain players are decoys or they're, they're not heavily involved in the game plan for a certain reason. 
Whatever works, works. And getting the ball to waddle incessantly last game worked. It worked, and it was innovative, right? The the flow of the play this way, and then you know the little pitch to, to waddle to go into the end zone was innovative. The little flea flicker call was well timed. Um, even the interception that Tua now I see a lot of nonsense about the Tua interception. We'll get to that, but you know there was a reason he threw that, and he explained it, and I'll get to that. But you know, Godsey's now he's starting to look like you know what you want in a coach is somebody who doesn't try to fit you know round pegs into square holes. You don't want somebody who's going to say, well, I have a system and I don't care who doesn't fit my system, like an Adam Gase. I'm running my system no matter who's on the roster. You don't want that, especially when you got a guy like Greer who's been picking pretty decent players as of late. Now that they've kind of come to fruition, we see that he's made some good picks. You don't want somebody coming in who's going to try to fit round pegs into square holes. And Godsey seems to be somebody who's getting the hang of really well playing to his players and the roster's strengths. So I actually think he's done a pretty good job as of late. And if you let him continue to get experience and you let him keep finding his legs and we have that continuity and he learns even more and he's familiar with the roster, there's no reason to get rid of him and go with somebody else now that he's doing a pretty good job. He knows the roster and he seems to be showing that he is competent in calling plays for this roster. Give him more weapons, develop the offensive line better, let the defense keep playing the way it is, and maybe let Godsey just take the reins and go another year and continue this momentum and continue his growth and let him stay the course I think it's the best decision so that's controversial take number one controversial take number two here it is in hindsight in hindsight Flores and Greer purging the roster of veterans actually worked out for the better long term I know it's completely against what I said it's against all the philosophies we've been talking about all year and I still think the reason we went on a seven-game losing streak, and the reason we started off so slow, I still think it's because they got rid of key veteran players. And it was going to happen that when you get rid of key veteran players, you're going to start slow, and it pretty much meant that this season was going to be in jeopardy early. And it was a tough decision to make. And maybe they should have kept the veterans, started off faster, and then eventually let the veterans sit to let the rookies take their place. I don't know. But long story short, if you look back now, and now you look at how Van Ginkle's coming on. Now you look at how Phillips is coming on. Now you look at even Eichenberg. He's not the best, but he's a rookie. He's not playing as bad as, you know, some other guys in the line. You know, you look at these guys. You look at Javon Holland. Now you see why McCann's got, like, you, you see these rookies really finding their stride. These young players really finding their strides now. I, I disagree on the offensive line. They, they could have kept Karras. You know, they could have kept a couple guys in the offensive line that would have changed the trajectory of the season. So, you know, I'm not saying that I completely agree with the exile of the veterans. I'm just saying that in hindsight now, getting rid of those players enabled these young guys to work their way in eventually. And now they've taken the reins and some of them are going to be stars and some of them are going to be very solid pieces. And for the long-term growth of the franchise, perhaps it was best to get these guys in, even though they were growing pains, and even though the front office and Flores probably knew they were going to be growing pains. Maybe getting them in for the now the next five years, it was worth the suffering. I don't know, because I don't know if we're ever going to get back to this momentum we have now. I don't know how things are going to go. The NFL is a crazy league year to year. But just saying, it's worth noting, controversial take, which again, you can argue with, and even I might argue with myself, but controversial take. Purging the roster, getting these rookies, giving, handing the reins to them essentially in the long run will pay off. And maybe they were on to something. Maybe they thought they would take the reins a little earlier and do better a little earlier. Maybe bringing in guys like McCourty, they thought that would pass the baton over while still winning some games without animosity from guys who have been here for a lot of years like McCann, you know, um getting jealous when rookies take over. When you have a guy like McCourty, it's kind of just a stopgap anyway. I don't know. It didn't work out well initially, but maybe it was for the better long term. Maybe this youth movement is. I will say this, though. You can't do this forever. And we have a lot of cap space next year, like the most in the league or second most in the league cap space. And we're going to have to keep some of our playmakers and our guys. We're going to have to keep Agba. I really think they should keep Gasicki. Everybody could talk all they want about Gasicki. Oh, he can't block. He's he's a weird tweener. He can't do this. He can't do that. Guys, you can't give up playmakers. He's a playmaker, and defenses have to scheme specifically to take him out of the game or to watch what he's doing. 
even if he's not involved one game. It doesn't matter. The defense has to keep an eye on him. You can't keep getting rid of playmaking pieces. And people always say, oh, look at Landry. He went away. He's not so great. Look at him. He went away. He's not so great. Okay, great. They went to other teams that don't know how to use him or they're the only playmaker and they're not so great. But you leave those pieces here. Imagine Landry on this team right now with a free Waddle up to be more than a possession receiver because it could be Landry. Waddle could be running down the field. There's all kinds of things we could do if we stop getting rid of every guy. Like when we brought in Brandon Marshall and then we get rid of Ted Ginn. Why? Marshall's a beast receiver, and Ginn could fly down the field. That was stupid. I'm not going to get into a whole Gesicki thing because it's not part of this video per se, but I'm saying we gonna, we're going to need to invest in the guys we already have with this cap space. And my point in saying that is this youth movement may have worked this time in hindsight, and now we have a good foundation of young players, and we should keep bringing young players in and keep letting them develop. But we can't have a philosophy as a franchise where we want to be the New England Patriots. Look, you're the New England Patriots when you win the damn Super Bowl and you win the Super Bowl every year and every year you're a contender. You can get rid of Philip Seymour. You can get rid of guys who are key players for their high value at their high points and bring in a bunch of draft picks and run your franchise that way, especially when you have mainstays like Wes Welk or Tom Brady, all these offensive linemen and all these other people. You could do that all you want. But we're not them, okay? And so you can't go from year to year, every year, get rid of guys at their high value, get a draft picks, and do a youth movement. Because if we do that, we're going to have the same year every year, which is going to be a middling around 500 team that struggles to make it the playoffs. And once they make the playoffs, can't win the Super Bowl. We can't do that forever. So while that might have worked, controversial take, maybe it was smart to go with the youth movement this year. In hindsight, in hindsight, maybe it'll bode well for the future. The future, it will pay off that we went with the youth movement which I know is controversial, but hey, it, it, it might pay off for us. It was painful earlier in the year. It might pay off, but we can't do that every year. So now saying that I think it might have been good in the long term, maybe we were a little bit wrong, maybe it was good in the long term, you can't do it again next year. You got to keep the vets you have. You got This is almost all young core now. We have almost no rentals anymore on this team, which again is maybe why it was smart. Like we went from some rentals to like no rentals. There are no rentals on this team. They're either a guy who's been here a long time that the staff has bought back into, or they are guys who were homegrown not only by this franchise, but by this regime for the most part. We don't have any rentals anymore. But now you're going to have to go out in the offseason, keep your guys that you grew here, keep them, and also go out and get some pieces, not rentals though. Don't go out and get a guy who you only envision being here for one year or two years. Go out and get a guy who's coming off his first rookie contract, who wants his first big contract, who you're going to keep here for five years, who's going to become one of our guys, a real legit piece that you believe in. Not a Will Fuller, a real guy who's going to be here, who's going to end his career here or, or something similar. The youth movement's great. We have no more rentals. We have nobody else's you know, throwaways. But now it's time to keep our guys, and it's time to go out and get some pieces that we believe in long-term, no more rentals. So maybe it was smart to get rid of the rentals and purge them long-term, hurt this season, but maybe long-term. But let's not do that again, okay? Let's go do what we got to do in free agency. Now, controversial take number three, and this is the one that's going to cause the most controversy. You probably already know what it is. Some of you are going to be jumping for joy that I'm still, you know, in the boat. Some of you are going to be mad that I'm that I'm not totally in the water yet. And it's just true. Controversial take number three. The jury is still out on Tua Tunga Vailoa, and he still, at as of right now, has not shown enough to convince me that he is the guy. Now that doesn't mean that he not hasn't shown me anything. I'm still impressed with the way he's played over the past several weeks. I'm still curious and anxious and happy and excited to see his development. I still think he could be a good quarterback in this league. I still think he's shown flashes of very, very brilliant sequences and throws and whatnot. But the jury's still out. There's nothing that I've seen on tape that says that Tua Tagovailoa is the guy or is definitely going to be the guy or that we should all kind of just put away any, any notions that he's not the guy or put away any hopes of anybody else coming in or et cetera, and we shouldn't just assume that the regime is sold on him. Now, this isn't because of reports. There are reports out there that the regime's still not totally convinced, blah, blah, blah. There are reports that the regime is totally convinced, whatever with the reports. I went back... Just because I'm hyped about Tua, you know, especially the Carolina game and the Giants game, I was hyped about Tua. I was like, this kid, look at his throws. Look at how he led the team down the field. These are good games. And they were. And they are. And they are part of the reason I'm starting to believe in Tua more. 
But I went back just looking at his highlights, like every throw Tua makes, you find them on YouTube. And I went back and looked at all the games during the win streak. And one of the interesting things I saw was like, you know, in, in memory, I'm thinking, wow, Tua had just these awesome blazing games and he just killed it. He killed it in the Ravens game and he killed it here and he killed it there. And he's a big part of it. I watched the film and I was disappointed. Like, like, cause you know, guys, I'm, I'm, I'm a fan like you are. So I fall victim to some of the same things that I criticize other people for. Like I want to believe Tua is like a superstar because it makes me feel good as a fan. Because if he's a superstar, we found our quarterback, like the futures, we can go anywhere. So I'm thinking like in my own fan head, I'm like, he killed it for seven games. But I went back just to see, and I wanted to, I didn't go back to talk myself out of it. I, I just went back to go enjoy how great he was. And I wanted to watch. And what I found was like, he didn't come into like the, what was, that, was it the third quarter in the Ravens game? And we were already playing a pretty good game. Like he, he changed it a little. Reset was terrible, but did he like, crazy in the like no did I say I meant yeah, Baltimore the Ravens game Baltimore I don't know what I said so if I said something else I'm sorry it's just morning and I'm going off but he didn't like and then several other games he had good throws and bad throws and he had misses and he had guys he, he didn't miss that he missed downfield and guys he hit and it's been a good run we've won he's been good but he hasn't set the world on he still hasn't taken that step and and Maybe the most interesting part is I told you a couple weeks ago, I said, I want to see Tua now take off. I want to see his trajectory just go through the roof. I want to see him own the moment. I want to see him prove this is where legacies are made. This is where franchise quarterbacks are made. This run now, take the reins now. The defense is going to give you the opportunity, but you got to take the reins. He did enough to win in every game that we won, enough to win. And everybody keeps saying, you could win with Tua. You could win with Tua. Yes, you could win games with Tua. You can win games with Mac Jones. You can win games with Chad Pennington. When it gets time to playoffs, when you're in the playoffs, when you're going up against playoff teams, if you have a defense as incredible as we have right now, you need a quarterback who's still going to be able, when the defense gives up a couple scores to another elite great quarterback, you're going to need a quarterback who's going to go in and take the game back for you, even when your defense is having a down day, or even when your defense is having a good day, but the guy across the field is just that damn good. Super Bowl contending teams need both components. You need a great defense, and you need a prolific offense, or at least one with a quarterback who can, who can make plays out of nothing when he needs to. This isn't 20 years ago where Trent Dilfer wins the Super Bowl. And this isn't even when Joe Flacco won the Super Bowl. And that defense was, like, generational. You need a quarterback to step up. And I'm not saying Tua won't do it. I'm not saying he can't do it. He showed me enough to think he can do it. And I hope he does do it. And I even say it's likely he can do it. But it's not a sure thing yet. The jury's still out. These next two games, I didn't see it in the New Orleans game. He played pretty good. And I saw... Colin Coward say it, and TD, Finn's talk, said it the other night. It's true. You know, Tua made the one throw to, to <clears throat> Matt Collins down the sideline, and then we, Godsey pulled out all these innovative ways to get us the one score to put the game away, which we did. doesn't mean Tua didn't play well there. He played well. That was a good drive. Then he had some good throws. He had a great pocket uh, presence at the end of the game when he stepped up with two tackles closing in on him, stepped right up in the pocket, delivered the ball perfectly to Gesicki for a first down. Great, great throw. I, I love a lot of the stuff I'm seeing from Tua. I'm not down on Tua. I'm not knocking Tua. I'm not saying we got to go away from Tua. I'm just saying the jury's still out, guys. And I want to see in these next two. I told you I would hold off my evaluation until the end of the year, and I'm going to hold off my evaluation until the end of the year. That's gonna. But if we go into these next two games and say Tua doesn't play very well and we lose one of them, we don't make the playoffs, that's going to have a, a way heavily on it. Let's say we go in and Tua has a really good game and engineers a couple drives down the field that, that put us in position to win the game, and we win the games. Well, that's going to have a lot to do with it. But just saying you can win games with somebody because they don't make mistakes and they throw for 150 yards, 240 yards, a touchdown and interception in every game, and we could win, that's not good enough to be a Super Bowl champion. Now, it's good enough now because we've struggled for so long. Look, I'll take it. For the next four years, I'll make the playoffs. I mean, it sounds stupid. It sounds like I'm, I'm hoping for mediocrity, but I'm a long-suffering Dolphins fan. I'd give anything to go back to those Jay Fiedler days where we make the playoffs often, but we lose. Fine. And if that's how we're going to play, fine. I mean, I'll take it for a couple years, but I'm not going to take it forever. 
I'm not going to accept it forever. I want to win, especially with this defense, with this caliber defense, with the way we've built this staff, with these young players, with this cap space. No, no, no. We need to be contenders soon, okay? Soon. Because otherwise, I don't know when this opportunity is going to come again where we've built this core the way we've built it. And we have this momentum the way we have it in this culture the way we have it. Now, before you bring up, he doesn't have a line, doesn't have a receiver. I know. Get him a line, get him receivers. Get him a line, get him receivers. But that's not going to change some of the decisions he makes. It's not going to change some of the trouble he's had on certain throws. It'll help. And go out and get the help. And I'm not saying you move on from him this year. Because here's the second part. First of all, the interception last game. This is the stuff where you see he's learning. Okay? He's learning. People say, oh, he just overthrew it. He just missed the throw. No, no, no. No, he didn't. He explained it. He thought Hollins was going to keep going straight. So he was throwing a back shoulder throw down the field to Hollins. Put him in a position to make a play the way he made a play on the next drive where he hit him on the sideline. He was going to put a back shoulder throw on him. Let him go up and get the ball. He trusts Hollins to do that. He still admitted he should have hit. Waddle coming across the middle, that was a first down, that was a chunk play, that could have been even more than that. He admitted he should have done that, but he thought he could hit Hollins. And again, it's in the kid's head. You don't go deep. You don't take chances. Blah, blah, blah. He's sick of hearing that. So he's going to go deep. He's going to take a chance, especially with a guy like Hollins who he trusts. It wasn't that he missed the throw. It's that he put it on the back shoulder as if Hollins was going to keep going straight and Hollins broke off into a post. And so Hollins was nowhere in the vicinity, so it looks like Tua threw it right to the receipt, to the D-back. He, he explained it after the game, and I, I don't know why so many people are still talking about it as if it was a misthrow. It wasn't a misthrow. He explained what happened. It was He read it wrong. He didn't even read it wrong. It, it was a miscommunication between the receiver and him. That's fine. I'm glad. He'll learn from that. He'll, next time he sees that type of play develop, he's going to take the 20 yards to Waddle or whoever's breaking across the middle. He's going to do that. That's how he learns. I still think he's learning. I think he's a great kid. I think he'll continue to learn. I think when you get an offensive line and more weapons around him, he's had, got even more potential. But the fact remains now. As a franchise, the pe- now, no, if he kills in the last two games and he steps up and he seizes the moment and the headlines are all over about Tua's, you know, if we see, and I keep going back to this game because I, never, I have never seen this game again from him and I want to see it again. The game against Arizona where he went toe-to-toe with Kyler Murray last year and he was brilliant. I need to see that, though. I need to see him in these next two games go toe-to-toe. I need to see him take the reins while the defense is doing their part. I need to see Tua take charge on the offensive side of the ball and and navigate down the field more than just once and put games away in playoff scenarios. And if I see that, if, if he does that in the next two games or even one of the next two games and we make the playoffs, then I say... There's no question. We got to move forward with Tua. There's, we shouldn't be looking at anybody else unless something crazy comes along, falls in our lap. We should be just sticking with Tua, building around Tua, doing everything we could around Tua because Tua is probably the guy. I will say that. If he doesn't do that, or if we lose one game, even if we make the playoffs, but he's still playing like this, like middling, he's not doing enough to, to, to settle it, then when you get into the offseason, that's when you got to look at things. Now, now everybody wants to talk about this. And listen, you think it went away. If you're if you're a big Tua supporter, you want to say it went away. If you're not a Tua supporter, you want to say it's a short thing still. You, And that's the elephant in the room, Deshaun Watson, right? I still got people on my timeline saying we still need Watson. We're still going after Watson. We're going to get Watson. He's still the plan, right? And I got other people saying Watson's ship has sailed. We're never going to get him. We were never going to get him, blah, 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 blah. The truth, like most things in life, guys, the truth is probably somewhere in the middle. It's probably halfway between what these people are saying and what these people are saying. The truth is, I think the franchise believes in Tua. I think the franchise has seen enough to think that Tua could be promising. I think the franchise is also still unsure if Tua is going to take that step and be that guy. And that Deshaun Watson is a top five quarterback physically on the field. But here's the thing. Like I said, if Tua goes out and takes the reins and has that kind of performance like you had against Arizona last year in these last two games or one of them and we make the playoffs, then I think it kind of it pushes way back, pushes way further back the possibility that we go after Deshaun Watson. Why would you? You have a young quarterback who's a great kid who believes in it with no off-the-field distractions who is showing you that he could be the guy. On the other hand, if Tua doesn't do that and rise to the occasion, you have a real dilemma on your hands, especially if Watson still wants to come here or some other quarterback like Russell Wilson or Aaron Rodgers or whoever. And what do the Dolphins do? What do they do in that situation? Well, here's my take on it. My take is this. If Watson can get rid of his legal issues, if he can solve his legal issues and they're gone, they're completely gone, and Tua doesn't show you what you want to see in these last two games and he doesn't show you he's the guy, or you're not sure, 
then you got to at least look at Watson and see what the price is going to be. And I think the price is going to go up if he settles his legal issues. So it's a kind of a lose-lose for us. On the other hand, if Watson doesn't settle his legal issues, the price comes down or the price stays the same, and you still don't see what you wanted to see from Tua, I think Tua's done enough where, look, we don't know if he's going to take the step, but you can't go out. Because just like I talked about with signing our free agents and keeping the culture up and the continuity with Godsey, just like I talked about that, it the same pertains to this, okay? You can't have this momentum and this culture building and the way the team, if you haven't noticed, the team, they all said it after the game last week or this week, they, and they all, you can sense it in the locker room. This is a close-knit team. This team cares about each other. This team has each other's back. When you start developing that type of chemistry in a franchise, that's like one of the best intangible qualities you could have in a franchise, and that's how you start winning games. You can't bring a guy in who's got a looming court situation over his head where you're in limbo because you disrupt the hell out of that chemistry. You put a dark cloud over the franchise where they don't know any day. Would you rather be in the playoffs and a contender and Tua could take the next step or could have a brilliant year one day? Or would you rather have Deshaun Watson go crazy, light the world on fire, get to the playoffs, and then... You know, all of a sudden some league decision comes down and your starting quarterback is yanked right in pivotal part of the season and we, for the rest of our lives, curse the sky at what it could have been. You can't have uncertainty looming over your starting quarterback in perpetuity and disrupt the momentum and the culture that we have right now in the locker room. So if Deshaun Watson has these legal issues still unresolved, if they're still hanging over him, you can't go out and get him based on what two has shown you so far. But if Deshaun Watson gets rid of those legal issues or they're very likely to be done away with and they get intel on that and Tua struggles, then you have to explore the possibility of a Watson. But this isn't a whole Watson conversation. This is more just me saying controversial take number three. No matter what people want to think, no matter how happy we're feeling right now, the jury's still out. Tua has done enough to win. He hasn't done so much that we lose. He's rebounded really well after interceptions, which I've said is a big thing. It's an awesome thing that he's done. And it's promising. But when you go back and look and you really think about it, he's not done enough to say, like, nope, hands down, he's the guy. He's he's, going to be a franchise quarterback. He hasn't done it yet. Hopefully he does. And hopefully, if not the next two games, then next year, if we we stay with him and we stay the course and he shows us next year and he continues to build. But... He hasn't done it yet. That's controversial take number three. Just saying. Let's keep our eyes on it. Let's hope he does do it. Let's hope he takes off like I've hoped. Let's hope he continues his upward trajectory. He's played well. It's been great to see. He's a great kid. Let's hope he continues it. But those are my three controversial takes, guys. Let me know what you think in the comments. Number one, we should keep OC George Godsey for all the reasons I stated. Number two, maybe in the long run, this purging of the veterans at the beginning of the year is going to pay off for us as a franchise. And number three, the jury's still out on whether Tua Tagovailoa is the franchise quarterback or not. Smash the subscribe button if you enjoy this even if you didn't enjoy it just smash it and get some content every now and then it's more dolphins content how could you say no to it smash the subscribe button smash the like button share the video share the channel let people know what we're doing here i want this to be a community where we're all talking where we're always thinking outside the box where it's all logical where it's all balanced where we evolve our opinions as the team goes forward because years from now guys 20 years from now whether two was in the hall of fame and we have two rings or whether two was long gone from our minds or whatever we're all still going to be doll fans we're still going to be a community and there'll be new topics to talk about and you never know when we're going to agree and you never know when we're going to disagree so smash the subscribe button and take this journey with me doll fans happy new year enjoy the game i'll talk to you guys after peace i know you heard me on the radio flexing she loved the sound of my voice it's the best thing daydreaming of the jazz all day pick up the